This is a case that Nick gave, um, but you know, 47 year old male here, um, healthy, fell off a roof. So these are usually high energy. So there's our falls, car accidents, uh, you know, people jumping off, uh, you know, moving things at the Indy 500, never a good thing. Um, <laughs> after a few, after too many drinks, uh, presents with pain, deformity of the left ankle. So you can see uh, there's bone sticking out. That's not normal, right? That's an open fracture. Um, and that's, that's basically an emergency for all of us. And here are the x-rays. So Nick, can you, you want to just describe these x-rays a little bit since this is your case? Yeah, so this is, a, this is actually one of my partner's cases and I, I borrowed it because it, it covered so many good principles. You know, the open wound, um, you know, the age of the patient being male, et cetera. Um, you know, so as I look at this, this is a distal tibia fracture with intraarticular extension. And you can see that the um, ankle is in valgus. Jan, how do you describe valgus to somebody? If you're, if you're a new rep and somebody says, this is in valgus, this is in varus, how do you describe that? Yeah, so I go for the, for the distal or the, the end part of the joint. So that would be, um, let me see if I can blow it. Uh, um, so that's gonna be this part, the distal is you know, for, you know, further away from the center of the body. And it's going to the outside. That's what I think of valgus. And if it goes to the other side towards the medial male, it's going to be in varus. Yeah. So in this case, you know, it's a valgus, um, uh, valgus deformity. So that you can see that there's a fracture that's fairly distal, fairly far down the tibia. And you can see, especially when you look at that lateral view, which is this view, uh, or can you point to the lateral view there, Jan? You can see on that, that lateral view, you can see that there is a fracture line that goes into the joint surface there. Um, you know, you can also see he has a previous calcaneus fracture, ORIF. So, you know, you know, this guy is maybe engaging in some risky behavior. Uh, it's it's a, also it's a second race. Yeah, second loss, <laughs> second Indy 500. And, yeah. uh, and so you know, the other thing is that there's also a, an associated fibula fracture. Um, and, uh, and that looks, you know, all of these look fairly comminuted. And if you were joined us for our ankle fracture talk, you know, those are rotational injuries. And these are a little bit different that they're not necessarily rotational, but they're more of an impaction injury. Right. So here, you know, one of the big things about this is it's different than an ankle fracture is many times you're going to want to stage them. So, you know, as a, as a rep coming to the, the thing, if you hear peel on uh, in the, uh, you, you know, that's going to be, you know, that's been scheduled. Um, if it's straight from the ER um, or from the clinic, this is something you might see being done, which is adding an external fixator. So Nick, what are your goals with the X-fix here besides missing the uh, tibia? Yep, here? That's my, that's my uh, mark. That's how I, uh, that's how you know, it's my case. The, uh, <laughs> You know, the goals of the, of the X-Fix is basically to provide stability so that the soft tissues can rest. Because one of the things you want to know about a pilon fracture, and, and there's a lot of them, but that this is not only a bony injury, but it's also a soft tissue injury. And, and Jan does a good job of pointing this out. If you ever follow Jan on LinkedIn, he does a great job of pointing out that this is an associated soft tissue and a, and a bony injury. So you can't, you have to provide some stability because oftentimes the tissues are too traumatized to go in and do an open reduction internal fixation right out the gate. So yeah. the goal is to provide stability, let the soft tissues rest, and then allow you to come back at another day. And in this case, you know, you remember there's a traumatic medial wound um, and, and that needs to be addressed as well. It needs to be washed out. Jan, can you talk about how you approach your debridement? Because I think this is important. Yeah, so so debridement is, I'm very systematic regarding it. Um, so I go superficial to deep and I debride all the layers. So, you know, you, you remove skin, some of the subcutaneous tissue and, and muscle and bone fragments. And um, you want to make sure that you debride the entire area. So you, you, you know, if the zone of injury is over here, you can see my red marking because that's where it was open. You want to extend this and debris a wider area because uh, that area that you're only seeing um, through the laceration is not the entire area area that needs to be debrided. Um, so you want to be more of a wider exposure. And you know the you know what they'll say is I've I've seen this uh, you know said in other talks. The issue is the tissue. 
right? It's, it's, so you don't worry about like the bone or anything like that. You got to get, you got to get the uh, soft tissue debrided as well as the bone debrided. Don't worry about the fracture or reducing anything at this time. Yeah. One of my partners used to say, you only get one chance to make a first, de- you know, do a good initial debridement. And, and I think that's true. So you want to extend it and, and work from superficial to deep and take your time. It's, and if you've ever been in a, in a case where some, they're doing a debridement, if they're doing a good job, you're probably feeling a little bit impatient and thinking, let's go, let's get this frame on, let's get this thing stable and get, get the, get the case going. But probably the most important part is the debridement. The rest the other things um, are, are probably a little less critical. And, and I would say too, this is, you know, an external fixator, you know, I think many of us can handle how to put these on, but I find it extremely helpful from the reps. Andy, Andy knows this, who's on this right now. Uh, when basically almost the X fix is ready to go, they, they kind of know which pins I use and what construct I'll use. And they might ask me if I'm going to like extend into the foot or just the ankle and so forth. And they kind of have things ready on the back table because unfortunately many of these cases come at night or on the weekends where you don't always have your a team yep in the or so it's just helpful i mean i can do it you know it's very helpful when like andy um has those things kind of you know ready to go and he i mean the clamps are ready he kind of knows he knows he knows the drill so yeah um, Yeah, it it, not only that but the drill bits you know do you drill or do you i mean i'm assuming you drill and then you place the uh shan spin or are you just I, I, if I think the X fix will stay on for some time, I pre-drill yeah. um, or if I have a resident doing it, if <laughs> I'm doing it, I don't pre-drill. I just put the uh, self-drilling pins. Yeah. But I think I the point the is, it's like having the, the, the chance pin sizes, being able to size the patient, know how far the bars need to go. You can have a lot of that stuff ready to go. And, and, you, and Jan hit it on the head. There's a lot of times that your A team, the team that you normally work with is not there and they need just a little bit more handholding, even though it seems like it's a, it's a very straightforward part of the case. Right. And then, you know, here's a, you know, many times what we'll do is, you know, either pre-op or, I mean, a pre-span or post-span, um, we'll get a CT scan and we're going to go over this a little bit more later, but uh, this is what's called an axial CT cut is what you have here. And you can see uh, basically three main pieces of the uh, joint. So you have the anterior lateral, posterior lateral, and anterior medial. So this is a this is more of a typical pilon fracture uh, with those three types of fragments that you almost now I wouldn't say universally see, but it's much more common. Um, so it's Nick, pretty, are you a pre-span guy or post-span guy? Well, <clears throat> I'm kind of whatever comes to usually whatever comes to clinic. Uh, so my preference is to get a post is post, uh, uh, spanning. I think I get more information from it. Sometimes that's not the way it works out in reality. Yeah, no, exactly. I agree. Yeah. So here you can see on the lateral too, Nick already mentioned it, um, or on the sagittal scan, it's that joint impaction. So this is much different than an ankle. So remember an ankle is going to be rotational injury. And a pilon is going to be more of an impaction injury. So you have multiple pieces. It's multiple fragments. There's more comminution. Jan, um, just one second. Okay, so let's make sure we we clarify. Um, you know, one the sagittal is going to be the view from the side. I always think you know sagittal aside. And then if you go back and just uh, show the the axial is is that you know, and that's really the money shot that that Jan showed there. That really helps you understand your articular reduction. And Jan's going to talk about this a little later. And then your coronal is the one that you're looking at it from the front, like if you're looking at an AP x-ray. Uh, for those of you who may not have as many CTs, I think just having that um, understanding is, is super helpful. Exactly, yeah. It's always like, it helps. Um, <laughs> so back to our initial case, <laughs> before, so we can end the evening here. So Nick, you want to take it away now? Yeah, we'll kind of buzz through it, you know, uh, pretty quick. But, you know, this was the case, you, know, you can see it got X-fixed. And so... Uh, started off fixing the fibula and, you know, it was comminuted, but was able to get it pulled out to length. And you can see that, you know, drill bit going in and um, you can flip to the next one. And then as it, as you know, with a kind of a mini open was able to get this pretty well reduced and out to length and screw goes in and it looks like it holds that fibula out to pretty nice length there. It's a little hard to tell on that, that lateral view. 
Um, this was had a pretty, you know, pretty good sized medial incision. And so the approach ended up being a direct anterior approach. Um, you know, you could go anterolateral, but I think if you go back to that articular approach, you'd be a little bit boxed out from being able to see into that joint. So the anterolateral or the direct anterior approach was used in this case. And as you can see here, an anterolateral plate, but to Jan's point, the distal articular reduction was done with leg screws from front to back. And you'll see a couple small K wires in there because there was a small uh, impacted articular piece that was separate on the posterior side of that little anterior piece. So that was, you know, booked open, use the K wires to provisionally reduce that articular piece, which sounds super easy, right? But that's actually really, really hard to do. Close it down, pins are cut short, and then the screws go from front to back. Now, Jan, one of the things I struggle with is when there's a posterior piece and I'm trying to leg from front to back, how do you hold that posterior piece in place? What tips do you recommend? I mean, in this case, it, we use they use some K wires coming from the medial piece kind of to hold that, that posterior piece, but what other tips do you have? Do you put a clamp on from front to back? It seems like there's a lot of rotation or over compression. How do you pick, how do you hold that? It's very difficult, like you mentioned, but I think, you know, putting the K, multiple K wires, so having K wires available, large clamps as well. Um, and then, you know, trying to manipulate it with a joystick. And, you know, I like what they did here or what you guys did with the uh, K wires. I also am a fan um, of using some of the bioabsorbable pins. Okay. Yep. Um, I was going to ask about that. For articular work, because if these pins, K wires, if they're threaded, they tend not to migrate, but if they're smooth, they can migrate and cause a problem. Yep. And now there's, so, you know, there's other options with these, like, you know, kind of compression uh, snap off pins that are fully threaded yeah. as well. And I think that's a really nice application for something like this as well, because now you're, you're not going to migrate. Um, uh, so there's some different options out there, I think. And so I think thinking through that, that part of your toolbox, uh, tools real quick, Jan, tools you like to have for your articular reduction. I'm assuming things like dental picks, freers, elevator, um, pituitary rongeur. What, what do you got on your table that, that can be? Yeah. And I also have tamps available. Tamps, get, yep. I think are very helpful. Um, all those things. And like you said, K wires for like, I would use it as like joysticks. Yep. So and in, in types, sizes of K wires, what, what should they have there? I mean, anywhere, these are four fives, I believe, but four fives, six twos, two, two point oh's. Yeah. Those three, I think are the workhorses. I think yep. the other ones are just kind of, you know, there to fill up the box. So the small ones for the pair, like the really distal articular reduction and the bigger ones to kind of hold those bigger pieces together that you can see here. Um, and then, you know, so then you, once you get the articular piece reduced, then the, that anterolateral plate goes on. You can see here, you know, this is kind of led up to my question. This one, you know, kind of comes a little bit higher than some, but it kind of sits where it needs to sit. And because they use these really distal screws, now you can see that it gives you a little bit more leeway with, with putting the plate where it needs to go. And then I think the final piece to this is some medial column support, even though, you know, you're wanting to push this back. I think it's important to think about that. Even if it's an, a screw that you put in percutaneously, um, there, I think there's growing body of literature, Jan, would you agree that having some medial column support in a case like this is probably important. Now, yeah. in this case, you probably don't want to put a buttress plate, even though it may look like it needs it because of the open wound. So thinking through, hey, yeah, plate might look really nice there, but if you don't take in consideration the soft tissue injury, um, I think you can can cause more problems. No, I agree. And I think this is where like the mini frag plate again, because you could potentially, at least it's not a thick plate, so you could still close over it if you needed to, or to use a screw. But yeah, I mean, and, and I'll it. use, if it's not open, I'll use a lot of um, uh, uh, third tubular plates. You know, simple, yeah. it's relatively small and thin and flexible. You can get it to fit quite well. Uh, you can lock it if you need to. So that, that's a good option. But a screw has been, I've, I've definitely used that quite a bit. Um, as well. And so this is at uh, maybe six weeks or, you know, maybe three months. I can't remember exactly when, but, but, you yeah, know, so even so at so this, you know, I think the articular reduction looked excellent. Um, and, and I thought it was a, a really well done, really well done fracture that kind of shows a lot of principles that we talked about.